All right, it's a little after seven. We've got a nice small group, so I think we'll just jump right into it. Um, welcome everyone, good evening. This is Doug Cook, your host for tonight. I'm the Education Events Coordinator for NOFA Mass. And I just wanna say you know, thanks for, for joining us. We're excited to learn from John um, a little bit more about your mind's nutrition requirements. Before we get started, I just want to say thank you to all of our sponsors. We couldn't do um, we couldn't do what we do without our sponsors, and so we um, want to encourage you to go visit them whenever you have the opportunity. These are our great sponsors here, and when you do support our sponsors, we hope that you will also um, tell them that you really love their support of NOFA. And with that, we also want to remember that we are all joining this presentation, hosting, presenting, and um, from land that has been inhabited prior to European colonization. And as an agricultural organization, we want to honor the people who came before us and as they worked the land and also as we improve the land, hopefully, um, for the people who will be coming after us. So this is a great interactive map where you can go and learn more about the people who came before us. And with that, I'm going to turn the workshop over to John. And you can get your screen sharing up when you're ready. Okay, so I'd have to do that to do again? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead and bring your presentation up. Okay. Well, well, thank you for attending this, uh, this evening. And I'm going to introduce myself before we get into the, the topic tonight that I'll be speaking about. My name is John Kaczynski, and I've uh, been counseling and teaching people about natural health for more than 40 years now, all throughout mostly all throughout New England, although I've traveled to South America and to Asia to teach people. And I regularly go to uh, New York City when things are normalized uh, and teach there at a natural food restaurant. I also do health counseling, uh, uh, focusing on nutrition, lifestyle, but I also recommend supplements and herbs and I also do acupressure and a kind of massage that works on the muscles and tissues in the body. Acupressure is for people probably who are attending this usually would know what that is. It's acupuncture without needles, uh, using finger pressure. And then I also use some massage techniques best based on some uh, 20th century body work to open up the tissues that have been tightened by stresses. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, tonight also. I also teach therapeutic exercises, some exercises to, to address something that I'll be talking about a little bit today, the uh, stress response that occurs in the body and that affects your organs. And then also from the ancient system of Qigong, which is the therapeutic exercises from China. And I teach that uh, to people also. So I teach that uh, I'm in Western Massachusetts in the Berkshire Mountains. Uh, in Beckett, Massachusetts, small town of Beckett. And I see people here. I, was, uh, I see people online too. I've been seeing people a lot online and on the f talking on the phone to give health advice during, during what's been going on in the last few months also. And then I also travel usually to, uh, to places like Connecticut and New York City regularly, uh, hopefully soon, sooner than later. In the near future, I'll be doing that. And I have some information at the end where you could find out more about me. Tonight, I'm going to be talking about your brain's nutritional requirements. And this is a picture that shows the effect of brain chemicals and nutrients on your health. Um, and I'll be talking about how, although we have some natural tendencies of our brain that we're born with, this can be very much influenced to affect uh, passivity, assertiveness, aggressiveness uh, by your nutrition, uh, by so nutrition affects, uh, nutrition doesn't tell you how to think. Um, we still have to learn and we still have to train ourselves 
to think or behave in certain ethical ways and to search for truth. Uh, but it does give a baseline for a healthy, stable functioning and good functioning of your intellect and mind. And there's a lot of evidence, both from traditional viewpoints that I've studied, like Oriental medicine, up to modern times with a lot of new information that people have, have uh, gotten and have researched about how nutrition affects the mind very powerfully. I'm going to be talking about, uh, going to be talking about some things that I didn't put as an overview, but I'll just tell about them now. Uh, and for instance, we'll be talking about nutritional requirements for healthy functioning, how to stabilize your mind and emotions, and how certain nutrients particularly affect the emotions and how your brain functions. I'll be talking about harmful dietary substances that affect the mind and the emotions. I'll be talking about toxic environmental su substances. Uh, recently, I was reminded that there's something like 100,000 chemicals in industry, and only a, hand, only a very few have been tested for toxicity. And very, almost none have been tested for the effect they have on together, uh, what's called the synergistic effect. So this has a very powerful effect, and we have to be careful to uh, minimize the effect that we're exposed to them, and also how to uh, get toxins out of our body, because today uh, everyone's experiencing toxins. Uh, probably people have heard the very remarkable and to me, shocking fact that all women have these chemicals from the environment in their breast milk when they measure the breast milk. And one of them that they have is jet fuel in the breast milk because it's so much in the environment right now. So we need to do some things to help us, our body to get rid of those to stay healthy for our brain because the accumulative effect of the toxic environmental substances and harmful dietary supplements substances affect us as we get older over time. And uh, so I'll be talking about what to do about them. Lifestyle practices I'll be talking about that are beneficial, that affect the mind, and ones that are harmful, that affect the mind. And life, when we talk about lifestyle practices, it's interesting because we get into another area that they studied traditionally, and there's modern science that supports this, is that the body and mind are connected. The body and mind are one. Um, and of course, this goes back into something that NOFA supports, that the body and soil is one too. So this is a, there's an old Japanese expression, Shindo Fuji. I studied with some Japanese teachers, uh, natural health. And Shindo Fuji means body, soil, not two. That was their poetic say, way of saying the body and soil are one. So our, what, we're, what we're eating has a powerful effect on us. We become what we eat, which given what people are eating today, could be a scary thought. <laughs> we become what we eat. And then we're gonna, I'm going to be also mentioning and touching upon, depending on the time we have left to do this, I'll be talking about the effect of stress on the body and the mind, how stress affects the body and the mind. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit about the aging brain. And... Uh, if time, uh, as we go through this, I'll be talking about nutritional myths uh, that stop us from eating healthfully uh, because of some of the tr nutritional myths like cholesterol is bad for you, saturated fats are bad for you, that we're, uh, we're always told. Uh, and over time, these are found to not be based. Some of, some of this and other ones are not based on good information or good science. Now, before we uh, get in, jump into uh, the different nutrients, starting with the different nutrients that help, that are required for your brain's nutritional requirements and your, the health of the brain, I just wanted to explain that I have a particular perspective that I call East-West traditional and modern. It's a combination of East and Western understanding and traditional and modern. And in the traditional Asian understanding, they looked at everything as energy and having their energetic effects. And there is some modern uh, understanding that supports that. And, um, but the modern view has focused on the more material aspects of nutrition, such as the components of nutrition like carbohydrates and proteins and vitamins, 
and fats. And I'm going to be going back and forth between, although I'll focus a lot on the material components of nutrition, I also will talk about them energetically, how they affect the body energetically. Because if we could make a link to the energetic effect, we could also make a link to what we need to eat and make a connection to that rather than thinking of ourselves as a science experiment. <laughs> so, uh, you know, protein, fat, you know, trying to get the balance right. Uh, goes beyond being a science experiment. So let's first talk about uh, some of these areas. I'll, I'll talk about each of these uh, areas. And uh, I'm not going to have a lot of uh, power points to, for these particular areas, but uh, will be recorded so you can hear it again. Um, people like to take notes. They can take notes. They can take notes later, too. You don't have to do it now. So first, uh, surprisingly, a lot of times people are not know that calories itself is a nutritional requirement. So we need a certain amount of calories to function. And the issue of calories becomes too much when we overdo certain kinds of foods, particularly in the modern diet. So modern foods, particularly made out of a lot of processed foods and a lot of animal products that are raised to have high amounts of fats in them, uh, as well as concentrated foods like sugars and flour and, and a lot of the foods that are in restaurants may uh, give you too many calories just by looking at them. <laughs> that's, that's a joke, but <laughs> not too far off, right? Because, uh, because they're you know, extremely rich and, and the restaurants, uh, one thing we're protected from now is too many restaurants, but some restaurants, especially the commercial chain, have been increasing their calories uh, so that basically when you get a dish that you may not think has much, it's probably enough calories for two meals. So calories, uh, but on the other hand, so when you're eating what I'm recommending, um, my approach, I'm going to talk about this uh, as we go on with this, my background originally, and you'll see this in my write-up and description, was a, what was a, I had a background in studying a macrobiotic approach to health and diet. And most people know about this as a primarily vegan diet that's low fat, low protein. Uh, the only animal food is occasional fish, no dairy, uh, no sugar, no many things. Sometimes called the no-no diet. It's none of everything and more none of that. But over time, uh, I, I had so much experience in counseling thousands of people that I found that some people did well on this and some people didn't. And then I started going back and studying traditional diets, uh, the work of people like Weston Price and other people who traveled and studied traditional diets and longevity diets. And I found that their diets included both vegetable and animal food. And there's a value of having both vegetable and animal foods in your diet. I also found many other discoveries that are not used in the macrobiotic approach. So my approach I call a full spectrum macrobiotic approach, which focuses on natural foods that are both animal and vegetable if a person's open to that. If a person's not open to that, I will work with other people who want to be vegan or vegetarian uh, to make balance. And I'll, I'll be explaining this a little bit later too as we're talking. But I mentioned this to say because I, I recommend a lot of unprocessed, mostly unprocessed or minimally processed foods for health. I think that's the best for health. Keep yourself well because they have the most nutritional uh, value to the body. And when you're doing this and people on a lot of natural diets, one of the key issues is that, especially if it's an extreme diet, and I'll talk about those diets in a little bit, you could be very low in calories because if your diet is low in fat, uh, cutting out animal protein, uh, cutting out you know, any sugars, lower on fats, your diet can be very low in calories and you need a certain amount of calories to be healthy. Now, how much you need, as we get older, of course, we don't need as much as when we're younger. And uh, it's possible on some diets to get too many calories, especially if people are using a lot of fat in their diet um, and a lot of you know, protein-rich, fat-rich foods, uh, it's possible. But usually, uh, natural diets, you have to... I, so I just mentioned this, because we need enough energy to fuel our system, including our brain. That's why calories are important, having a certain amount of calories. I won't give a number, 
because this changes as we get older. Then carbohydrates uh, are important for the brain function. Um, so we need energy, just pure energy coming from food, that's calories, because our brain requires a lot of energy. And the human race is distinguished from other animals because it has the highest development of cognitive function. Um, although my standard joke is we don't always act like that, especially in politics. But <laughs> I'm not going to get into any particular politicians, but we, we don't always act that way you know, in daily life. But we are, do have the potential to have the highest cognitive function, uh, thanks to the evolved brain. Now, the brain is about 1,400 grams in weight, which is only about 2% of body weight. But this has the highest consumption of energy and oxygen in the system. So when we, we'll get to that a little bit later, that the consumption of oxygen makes exercise really helpful for your brain. Because when you exercise more, you get more oxygen in your system. And uh, that basically makes your brain function better. Adult brain uses about 20% oxygen supplied to the body and almost 20% to 30% of the energy consumption of the body. And the developing brain of an in infant uses 50% of the energy of the body. Now, the primary source of the energy to the brain is glucose. And glucose, if depleted, like in fasting or doing a lot of exercise where you use up all your Glucose is the sugar, the main sugar in the body that everything converts to, everything you eat converts to, and even protein converts to if you don't eat enough carbohydrates. So what happens is your body will start to run on ketones for limited amounts of period. And we'll talk about the ketones and the ketogenic diet in a little bit. Um, so the brain has a very fast metabolism and Carbohydrates are really the only nutrients that can match the high energy requirements of the brain. It's not that people can't do on a low carb diet for a while. Your body can handle any kind of stress for a period of time. The younger you are, the more stress it can handle. Um, the older we are, the less it can handle. So carbohydrates are needed as a brain fuel. But the question becomes, of course, what kind of carbohydrates uh, are needed for the brain? And primarily, I, I have found over the years and recommended for people that there's carbohydrates from unrefined sources tend to be the best. And refined sources, like naturally refined sugars, such as good old New England maple syrup or raw honey, would be used for quick energy when we need a lot of energy quickly. But mostly, we need things like starches, which are the complex carbohydrates, things like grains whole grains, even processed grains like, you know, or a good quality white rice and processed grains in the forms of noodles, whether it be whole grains or, or other types. But we, whole grains would include things like brown rice and barley and millet and quinoa. And these break down a little bit more slowly uh, than things like simple sugars. We could get carbohydrates from sugar when we need quick energy, sugars from fruit. Um, I recommend uh, in line with the Shindo Fuji, Body and Soil is one, that we primarily get our, our sugars from local sources like fruit that grows in our area, although we can break that rule too. But, you know, in the summer, that would be things like berries and melons and, you know, peach season is coming up and apple season. So local fruits where, which have a different kind of sugar in them. Apples almost have a similar starch into them that's in grains. And the grain sugars are complex carbohydrates that break down more slowly. So I recommend people eat those regularly at meals. Potatoes and sweet potatoes can be part of that. Potatoes are more something that grows in New England. So I recommend those over sweet potatoes, though sweet potatoes can be also fine to use as carbohydrates. And natural sugars, when we need quick energy, quick energy sources are needed by people like athletes. So um, in the past, I've worked with athletes and I've made homemade sports drinks. You know the sports drinks? I think everybody's familiar with those, the ones that are blue and orange and glow in the dark, you know, Gatorade, not to mention any names. But uh, the homemade sports drinks are not as sexy. They're not blue and orange. 
their apple juice and water and salt. The salt is the electrolytes. And they work really well, <laughs> and much less cost. Uh, and you don't get all this junk chemicals and other stuff that's in there and these sugars that are in there. Uh, so, so basically, simple sugars have the role of giving quick energy to the body when we're basically under a lot of stress and use up a lot of energy, you need to get sugar in the body. That could be from a, a natural juice. It could be from the sports drink. Uh, it could be from natural sugars. Uh, simple carbohydrates also act like simple carbohydrates are things like noodles and, and pastas and things like that. Now, there, are, there is evidence when we talk about carbohydrates being good for the brain because our brain runs on carbohydrates, breaks it down to glucose. So we need a reg, ready, ready supply of those at meals. It doesn't mean that someone cannot go low carb for a period of time, but my experience has been when people go low carb too long that it puts the body in a stress mode. And the body starts also converting, unless someone goes really low on proteins and goes into a, a ketogenic a type of diet, then what happens is the body will start actually turning proteins into glucose. Uh, from what they're eating, but that puts the body in a bit of stress. I'll talk about this, this stress in a little bit too. Now, uh, my sense is that also the, the influence of carbs on diabetes may be related more to refined carbohydrates, which I, I'm going to talk about that as a substance that could interfere with the brain function and have a harmful effect in a few minutes. And also is related to other factors, especially factors that make cortisol high. Rather than carbohydrates alone, it's the cortisol. Cortisol is a stress hormone that goes up when the body's under stress. So it can go up if you don't eat enough food. It can go up if you don't get enough nutrition. It can go up if you have a lot of stressful circumstances. Uh, it can go up if you do too much exercise. It can go up if you basically are exposed to toxins. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but this factor seems to be a big factor in um, the creating of diabetes over a period of 20, 30 years, or sometimes very quickly, if you have a high stress uh, right away. Now, the, uh, so talking about carbohydrates, people will often ask about the low carb diets and uh, the use of the ketogenic diet. And what, what's interesting about uh, that is that ketones is a process that happens when you don't have enough carbohydrates, and it's something that your body burns for energy. And it, it, uh, instead of burning fat, it burns something called ketones, which can be used for fuel. It can be used therapeutically for people um, who basically have uh, epilepsy and some other neurological problems. The problem with using it all the time is that when your body burns fuel uh, as fat, a kind of fat for fuel in ketones, basically it's a disease state. That's what diabetics do. So over a period of time, it could put the body into high stress mode. And you also have to eat a very low protein diet as well, low carbohydrate diet, which can be very hard for people to sustain. But the stress effect of that can affect the brain. And that's why I mentioned that, that, that basically you can, it uh, affects the brain and cause problems with the brain function. Because under stress, the circulation to the brain slows down and then certain things affect the brain, the brain function. So uh, now also when talking about carbohydrates, what often comes up is people talking about the, uh, the famous book that was written a few years ago by Dr. Perlmutter, Grain Brain, where he talks about, especially if we're on the topic of the brain, he insists that basically that the brain is affected by eating grains, you know, gluten and gluten-rich grains and other grain. But when people have looked at his claims very carefully, it's found that he is doing what a lot of people in health do, and I did too for many years because for many years I recommended a, a totally vegan type of diet uh, until I found people were getting sick from doing that after 20 years or 30 years, and some people were actually getting serious disease. 
Uh, not to say that someone can't do that if they're balancing it right. I'll talk about that a little bit. But, I, but what was happening is that the, what I was doing back then is something that Dr. Perlmutter did, does in his book. He's cherry picking. I don't know if you've heard of that where you just pick the research that supports what you're saying and not picking the research that goes against it. So uh, research has been done um, by, you know, by different people on the two diets that are very high in carbohydrate called the DASH diet and the Mediterranean style patterns and age related cognitive decline. And both of these diets were associated with consistently higher levels of cognitive functions in elderly men and women over 11 year period. So uh, that plus, uh, there's other evidence that shows that carbohydrates don't make the brain decline. Now a diet high in sugar, refined sugar, that's a, another ballpark we're, we're talking about in a little bit, we'll talk about that. Now proteins, we're gonna talk about proteins. Before we talk about proteins, I'm actually going to uh, skip the order here and talk about fats first, because of fats. Now, fats themselves have many very benefits for health. And uh, it used to be that fats were demonized totally. And in some circles, especially people who are advocating totally vegan diets often, they still demonize fats. And the fats, the right kind of fats are very potent energy of sources. So without the right kind of fats and enough fats in your diet, it's often very hard to get enough calories. And although we, I don't recommend people use fat as a main fuel, the difference between carbohydrates and fats for fuel is fats burn slowly and carbohydrates burn quickly. So there's a benefit of having some slower burning fuels like fats for endurance and quicker burning fuels like carbohydrates. So I recommend them both. Now fats also maintain on a nutritional level, fats maintain strong cell membranes. They also produce things like white blood cells. So you have to have enough fat to produce white blood cells. You also need a certain, the research shows that evident, you need enough fats to uh, absorb B vitamins, which are very important for brain function and body function and energy. You need enough fats also to absorb calcium for strong bones. Calcium does play a role in the brain. Calcium is a natural tranquilizer. So if you have enough calcium in the body, it makes you feel calmer and more even in, in your moods. You also need enough fats to absorb the vitamins D, E, A, and K. And among them, the E and the D are very important for brain function. So you need a certain amount of fats in your diet. Now, from an energetic level, uh, this is something that I look at because of the, my research and studies of Asian traditional medicine. Carbohydrates are quick burning energy. So often we need, because our brain and our body requires a lot of energy, we need a certain amount of carbohydrates just to make the brain function and the body function, to get this quick energy. Fats are slower burning energy, but fats also are affecting your cell membranes and they build your cell membranes. So we need a certain amount of fats for building cell membranes and also for, uh, for basically also for slow moving energy. Now, the half right idea about fats being harmful, I'll talk about in a little bit. And in a little bit, I'll be talking about the fats that are harmful, which are these omega-6 fats that are in the vegetable oils and some animal foods that are basically raised with certain kinds of food that they're given. It makes them very high in these omega-6 fats. I'll talk about that in a little bit as harmful substances. The fats that are most helpful for the brain, but before we step into the fats that are most helpful for the brain, uh, let's just talk about this key factor of why fats are very beneficial. 60% of your brain is fat. And so the most stable fat that is good for the brain is saturated fat. 
And if you don't eat saturated fats in foods like natural animal products, grass-fed dairy, dairy products from grass-fed animals, uh, certain amounts in meats, or natural fats like butter from healthy animals and coconut oil, what happens is your body produces a lot of saturated fat. And although there's some evidence that you need to, to have a bit of saturated fat in your diet so that your body doesn't have to produce it, there's some evidence that the, the one you take in from food are, is better than the one you, the body produces. And the saturated fat, compared to other fats, gets into the brain and protects the brain from degeneration and damage because it's a very stable, hearty fat in the body. This is the opposite of this. I'm going to, I have to talk about this now, although I'll mention it later, is these vegetable fats that have been prominent in the modern diet since the 1930s, vegetable fats from soybean oil and safflower oil and other oils have gone up in the diet a thousand percent. And these are in a lot of processed foods. Uh, when you go and get a pastry at a store, it's not butter anymore, unless you go to the French bakery where they're putting in butter. It usually will be soybean oil. That's what's the fat they're using in that. And most, it's, even in the supermarkets, you, the common things that you get there, whether it be processed foods or nuts, uh, uh, not nuts, but things like chips and pies and cakes will have vegetable oils in them. So we're getting a lot of vegetable oils and when they get into the brain, they could degenerate more. So the degeneration of the brain will also make degeneration of function. And also we'll talk about this more prone to things like Alzheimer's disease, as well as other brain malfunctions as we get older, like senility. So saturated fats are protective. So I recommend things like butter from grass-fed animals for pure vegetarians, vegans. I would recommend things like coconut oil be used regularly in some coconut products to get the saturated fat. Now, 25% of the fat in the brain is cholesterol. So saturated fat has gotten a bad rap. That's one of the myths. They discovered that it doesn't raise your cholesterol and cause problems. And the other part of this is also it was discovered that the cholesterol from food, like animal products, eggs and meat, and chicken and fish, doesn't raise your cholesterol uh, by the cholesterol. Now, it could raise your cholesterol if you overate animal products, like overate protein, but that's only because it puts your body in a stress mode. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, Actually, I might as well talk about it now. <laughs> when you overeat protein, high amounts of protein, we're talking about like 12 ounce steaks and huge amounts of protein in the diet without carbohydrates to balance it of some type, then what happens is the body produces more stress hormones and stress hormones are made out of cholesterol. And the cholesterol is made by your liver, not from the food you eat. So when people have high cholesterol, there's a couple of reasons, but one of the reasons is that when the body's in the stress mode, it produces too much cholesterol and in order to produce the stress hormones to deal with stress that you're experiencing. So we need a certain amount of cholesterol in our diet. It's actually healthier for your body to be eating cholesterol and not always producing it. Again, our body produces it when we don't need it. So, uh, People who have ever been on a very low fat diet and felt tired all the time, one of the reasons is that the brain is not getting enough fat. And the brain needs to fat and we need it from our diet. Also, there is a link between low cholesterol and cognitive decline. So when the cholesterol becomes too low, the brain doesn't have enough cholesterol to, to function. And basically uh, we need for integrity of something called the myelin, um, which is the what gives the process which makes the electrical communication between the cells in the brain. You need some very stable fats because the myelin is made out of cholesterol and which you can also, and also the saturated fat makes it more stable. Of course, cholesterol is the basis of a lot of other hormones, just as we mentioned, although we're talking about the brain, cholesterol is the basis of all the sex hormones, 
uh, cortisol, which is also healthy to have a certain amount of cortisol because it, this is produced by these stress glands called the adrenal glands. So this is, a, this is the, the skinny on fats, you might say, <laughs> the skinny on fats. And then let's go to protein, go back to protein. So protein is a very interesting, proteins have a very interesting role in brain function, particularly on moods. There are the brain, there are four major brain chemicals and these brain chemicals are made out of protein. So we need a certain amount of protein in our diet. Uh, I have on my website, I'll, I'll uh, link to this a little bit later on, but on my website, for people who want to be vegan or vegetarian, I work with people like that in consultations. And I have a, I have a page on my website that is addressing how to be safe on a vegetarian or vegan diet. And one of the things that I'll just mention now is that one of the reasons that I changed my approach to health, and I call this a full spectrum, macrobiotic means longevity. So the original meaning was a longevity diet. One of the reasons I changed my approach is because when I was working at an institute, a famous institute called the Cushy Institute in my hometown, used to be in my hometown, which was a natural health school. And I was the longest teacher there for 27 years. But over time, I started to see teachers get sick with cancer. And anybody who saw books on macrobiotics, there's a famous book called The Cancer Prevention Diet, and the diet was supposed to prevent cancer. But these people were long-term vegans, 25 years, 30 years, and were getting cancer, and they passed away from cancer. So as after the first person uh, passed away from cancer, who was one of my teachers, Aveline Cushy, I started to really look at this, and that's when I was investigating people like Weston Price and Weston Price organization. Later on, I gave a lecture at one of their workshops uh, on my form of diagnosis that I created um, out of an East-West approach to diagnosis, um, East Asian diagnosis and the modern traditional biology, modern biology combined. And so I started to look at longevity cultures and then I started to look at from a nutritional and energetic perspective, what is in animal food and vegetable food that's different. And what I found is that there are certain nutrients and qualities of energy we get from vegetable foods, certain qualities of energy that gives us energy, carbohydrates and sugar, and helps us relax. Some of the vegetables have these phytochemicals that make relaxation and nutrients. And, uh, and some also, uh, and other kinds of components that make us relax and relax the body. And then animal food has certain components in it, such as these proteins and concentrated forms and many, many nutrients that are not in any vegetable foods, such as B vitamins and certain minerals like zinc. So that is why traditional cultures valued them. And the interesting thing is that traditional cultures around the world had two sacred foods. One was grains and the other ones were animal foods. Both were considered sacred foods. So sacred foods, everything was mixed together in traditional cultures. They didn't separate religion from, from health and living and farming. It was all to one, it was all a, a mash together. They had no separation. So they put it in religious terms that it was sacred uh, because it was sacred for their survival. So that's how they, they designated. So proteins have a unique role in that when you're eating a, a, a vegan diet, grains and beans and vegetables don't have, according to good research that has been done in modern times, that we need a certain amount of nutrients. For, mo for many people, it's hard to get enough proteins from only veg 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 vegan type of foods, grains, beans, vegetables, fruits. And also on top of that, there's another issue is that there are certain kinds of proteins um, that are available in animal food that some people absolutely need. They're, they're called the non-essential proteins. And one of them is very good for the brain. I'll mention that in a minute, called tyrosine. I'll explain what it's good for. And other ones like carnitine. It's carnivorous, it comes from carnitine. And 
many times also uh, it's hard for people to get enough protein. So on my website in where I have the article on how to be safe on a vegan diet, I explain that vegetarians can easily get more nutrients from eating dairy food from healthy animals that are grass fed or grazing and eggs from free range chickens or truly free range chickens like pasture chickens. So if they eat those on a daily basis, they can get enough nutrients and protein along with their grains and vegetables and fruits and other natural foods to stay healthy. For vegans, often they can't, I don't recommend soy as a source of protein like tofu and tempeh as in high amounts because it has some anti-nutrients in it. Uh, the two anti-nutrients are goitrogens that hurt the thyroid and phytochemicals or phytoestrogens that act like estrogen. And the traditional use of these were only in small amounts because the traditional view of tofu and tempeh were they were cooling. Foods that were cooling slow the metabolism and in excess can slow the metabolism too much. So for instance, even today, people follow in China having something like a little more tofu in the summer when it's very hot, but not as much in the winter because they knew the cooling and warming effects. The cooling effects might be said to be related to the goitrogens. The goitrogens slow the thyroid, which slow your metabolism, cools you down. Phytoestrogens also have the effect of, uh, when the estrogen levels are high, the metabolism slows down too. We'll talk about that, I'll touch upon that in a few minutes. So we have fats and we have proteins and carbohydrates and calories, all these essential things for the brain. Now, the uh, last thing to mention is just vitamins and minerals. And key vitamins and minerals are B12, things like B vitamins, magnesium, zinc, copper, iron, iodine, selenium, magnesium, potassium, choline, and all the antioxidants. Now, I'll go over that again, but you'll hear it, you know, you can stop the video later when you get the video and to write them down. But I'm gonna talk about a few of these. B vitamins are in vegetable foods, but certain B vitamins like B6 are more absorbable in animal products and dairy products. B12 is the same, it's more absorbable. So this becomes a point if someone wants to be totally vegan, Things like B vitamins and B12 are some of the foods that would be, in, some of the supplements that would be important to take uh, to keep their brain and body functioning because it has an effect on the whole body. B12 has a particular function on the brain. And after 60, there is evidence that most people should be taking B12 anyway, even if you're eating animal products because the absorption goes down. Uh, the kind I recommend is a sublingual B12. Uh, people who are vegan should really be taking B12 and many vegetarians because the level of B12 in dairy products and eggs is lower than things like meat and certain kinds of fish and, and also uh, poultry and other animal foods too. So the, uh, so the B12, the amino acids we talked about is, is amino acids are the proteins and some, the, Amino acids in animal protein and dairy protein, eggs, is much more absorbable to the body than vegetable protein. So that's why I do recommend as if someone wa wants to be purely vegan that they use some uh, protein powders, uh, but not made from soy, made from rice or pea, just to get more, uh, more of the proteins and amino acids because, um, I'm gonna back up again because I said I was gonna talk a little bit about these brain chemicals. So I'm gonna back up to talk about the brain chemicals now because we're talking about amino acids. So the four mood controlling brain chemicals need and require protein. So I'll briefly mention these. If you wanna look more at this, there is a good book called The Mood Cure and The Diet Cure by an author, Julia Ross. The Mood Cure and the Diet Cure by Julia Ross. She talks about the link between the brain chemicals and the moods that we have. And the four mood molecules are serotonin. Serotonin makes you relax. 
And if serotonin is excessive, it makes you relax too much. Uh, serotonin can be used up by stress, but it needs a certain amount of protein, very important to produce it. And then the second mood molecule is uh, a bunch of mute mood molecules. It's a whole series of them called the catecholamines and affectionately known as the cats. Nothing to do with the Broadway play, no, <laughs> the cats. So it's the cats. So the catecholamines and the main cat is dopamine. So the catecholamines are such that when you have enough catecholamines, you feel very alert and sharp. And uh, if it's lacking, you feel the blahs. And some people are born with less catecholamine and some people are born with a huge amount. And the people who are born with a huge amount are those people who wake up without a cup of coffee and drive you crazy because they're so up and so alert as soon as they wake up. <laughs> and uh, so those are people who have natural amounts of those. Uh, then, so we have serotonin, uh, the catecholamines, the main cat is dopamine. And then you have GABA, and GABA is basically, uh, is short, let me see if we have it here, yes. Well, GABA is short for a, a longer name of a brain chemical. But this brain chemical is the natural tranquilizer in your body. So when your body basically, you're under, when you basically need to relax, and usually at the end of the day, the GABA kicks in. People who don't have enough GABA often turn to substances like alcohol and also marijuana to imitate the GABA. But the GABA is produced by the brain and the GABA is made out of protein also. So you have to have a certain amount of concentrated protein in your diet to produce GABA. And then basically the last brain chemical is called the endorphins. So everybody I think is, uh, you may have heard of the endorphins before. So endorphins are produced by a lot of body cells, but it's also produced by the brain. And when you produce endorphins, basically your body produces endorphins when basically you need to uh, relax in a deeper level, it gives you pleasure, the endorphins. And uh, opiates will basically imitate the endorphins. And the endorphins are used up when you've been under a lot of pain. They're your natural painkillers. They're produced by the body, they're produced by the brain. And when people have been under a lot of emotional or physical pain, they use up all their endorphins. And then that's when they get attracted to substances to imitate the endorphins. To some extent, all the addictive substances do that, but the, uh, the most powerful of those are basically the, you know, the drugs like heroin and the heroin-like drugs that are in the painkillers, you know, the heroin-like drugs. They, they, stim they imitate the endorphins, but they don't give you the endorphins, but they imitate the feeling of the endorphins and they're addictive because of this. So whenever we do anything that's pleasurable, we do produce endorphins also too. So these brain chemicals require a certain amount of protein in your diet. And particularly if you had exhausted these brain chemicals, then you basically need to have more of these to basically uh, to produce the brain chemicals. Now, something like serotonin, and GABA and endorphins are produced by any concentrated proteins will start to produce more of these. So the, then the one class of brain chemicals, the catecholamines are stimulated by a certain kind of protein called tyrosine. And this can be taken for people who don't want to take it in a food as a supplement but it is in certain animal foods. So tyrosine is high in pastured, truly grass-fed eggs, but it's lower in commercial eggs that are factory farmed. It's higher in the grass-fed pastured eggs. It's also higher in meat, especially red meat is the highest uh, source of this. So that if a person is low in the tyrosine, 
or experiencing the blahs too much or not alert and focused, because that's what the catecholamines make you, then things like red meat and eggs will help you be more focused and alert and upbeat. There's also, it has been promoted that serotonin is deficient when you're depressed. This has been primarily promoted by the drug companies. So they could sell these drugs called serotonin uptake inhibitors. These keep more of the brain chemical in your brain. But this doesn't make sense because serotonin goes up at night when people get more depressed. It goes up in the winter when people get more depressed. The brain chemical that goes down at night because it's influenced by the sun and goes down in the winter is the catecholamines. So usually the depression is more related to the catecholamines, which needs the tyrosine for that to help it. Now, from an energetic viewpoint, animal proteins, they had a different way of looking at energy uh, in oriental medicine. They basically, their idea of yin and yang of foods was foods that were yin build substance and can relax the body. And foods that are yang were energizing. And the interesting thing about animal foods is they classify those as both. They build substance in the body and they give energy. And so uh, for our discussion of the brain, then basically what's happening is that these substances are building the brain. They're actually building the brain chemicals. And they're also energizing the brain in a very particular way. So that is how they're important. Now to get back to the, uh, the nutrients, selenium is primarily in animal food. Uh, yes, it's in Brazil nuts, but you only get a small amount in there. And uh, it's also the choline is very high in certain foods. It's high in soy products, which choline is very important for the brain to function. But it's more absorbed, it's also in things like eggs and dairy products and fish. So uh, it's actually easier to get from the natural animal foods than it is to get from others. Some people who, who don't want to eat those foods uh, will use also lecithin uh, to get a high amounts of choline. That can be a supplement that can be used for choline. The last thing for vitamin and minerals, and this will be something that we'll talk about when we touch upon the aging brain, is that because the brain is high, has high amounts of fat, it easily degenerates and oxidizes, fat oxidizes. The saturated fat is more stable, but it still can oxidize. So that antioxidant vitamins are very important to protect the brain. Now, some of the, we could, ideally we should get these from food or the body produces them like vitamin D from the sun. Although after 60, there's evidence that you don't produce as much. So you need it from food or a supplement after 60 more. Uh, so we need, you know, fat soluble vitamins like that. It also helps as effect on the brain function. Vitamin E and C are very important antioxidants that protect fat from degenerating in the body, whether it be in your arteries or in your brain. So uh, after a certain age also, it may be beneficial to take a good quality vitamin E supplement from natural sources. Uh, a brand that is very high quality is called Unique E. And also it may be beneficial besides getting it from food to get vitamin C from food like leafy greens and some fruits but also to take a supplement because the C will protect the brain from degeneration. Um, and it protects the body in many other ways as we get older, several thousand milligrams uh, per, per day. Now, we're gonna to touch upon these, uh, some of these more than others, but excess refined, here are harmful dietary practices. Excess refined sugars and artificial sugars. Artificial sugars have been found to affect the brain and damage the brain. Uh, many years ago, I was counseling a woman who had multiple sclerosis symptoms. 
So she had all the symptoms of multiple sclerosis affecting her walking, affecting her talking, affecting her posture. But the testing was inconclusive for multiple sclerosis. They didn't know what was causing it. Well, it turns out that she had a Diet Coke habit. So she would go through something like four of these huge, something like three six packs of Diet Coke a day. And she did this for years and years and years until she was diagnosed. Now, one person doesn't make proof, but they have some evidence that the artificial sugars, certain kinds of artificial sugars like aspartame will affect the brain, can affect the brain because of the chemical makeup. If you look this up, you'll see some research on that. Now, excess refined sugars cause problems a couple of different ways. One, the body, it may disturb the blood sugar when you're eating high amounts of refined sugar. They haven't done research on this because it's considered unethical to do it, to give people a lot of refined sugar over a year or two. It's considered ethical, unethical. But the interesting thing is they gave refined corn syrup in, in sodas over two weeks. So they give refined sugar over two weeks. Over two weeks, they didn't see any change in the blood sugar. They give basically uh, corn syrup refined sugar in Coca-Cola or sodas, which is mostly in sodas now, there's no sugar in them. Over two weeks, they start to see diabetic changes in the person, in just two weeks. I think over time, high amounts of refined sugar have a double effect. One is that it displaces real food, other foods that people are eating, so they fill up on this. That Unfortunately, this happens in poor neighborhoods, in the ghettos, where they eat a lot of processed foods. They're filling up on sugar and white flour and bed oils. And also, I think over time, it can have a taxing effect on the blood sugar mechanism in several different ways because it puts the body in a stress mode to eat high amounts of refined sugar over a period of time because it's artificially pushing the body uh, into uh, energy. Then the second, poor quality vegetable oils. I talked about this, the omega-6 fats, the vegetable oils are the oils that have gone up a thousand percent in the last 60, 70 years. And these oils have an effect to basically, they're very, what you might say is they're very perishable inside the body. They oxidize and break down and go rancid. So when they get in the brain, that the possibility of this, I'm not sure if I could see the research, but it makes sense logically because they break down so easily in the body. If the brain is full of these fats instead of saturated fat, they could easily oxidize. On top of that, if you basically don't have enough antioxidants in your body, uh, then this occurs very rapidly. And this, we'll talk about more. I think this is a major factor in things like cancers, particularly breast cancer, heart disease. There's a link to these fats and heart disease. And if the arteries get clogged, you also don't have circulation to your brain, which will affect your, your brain function. Chemicals and pesticides in foods. These have different effects uh, that we don't know about, but the pesticides are something called xenoestrogens. So xenoestrogens are mean like fake estrogens. They act like estrogen. And they are very high in commercial animal foods because they're high in the grains, commercial dairy foods because they're high in the grains that the animals are being fed. They're high in some cash vegetable and fruit crops. Uh, some of you, because you're involved with NOFA, might know about the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. The food, the desert Dirty Dozen is the foods that have the most, the vegetables and fruits that have the most pesticides in them. And a lot of these are cash crops, like berries, strawberries particularly. And so basically we have to be careful of these because these xenoestrogens depress your metabolism. And when your metabolism depresses, all functions go down, including your brain function and your circulation to your brain. So it's, 
as most people who attend NOFA conferences, is best to get organic, you know, or at least chemical free or sustainably raised without chemicals or minimal chemicals. Eating too little is a harmful dairy dietary practice because your brain doesn't get enough energy and this makes it malfunction. So some people are very sensitive to this. So if they skip a meal or two meals, they start to get angry. Sometimes that's called hangry. When you're hungry, hangry. And they start to also not be able to focus or think or do well in school. Uh, this on top of eating bad meals, this is a problem for school children because they'll eat pop tops, you know, the sugary, floury breakfast, and then they go to school. But they don't have any nutrients to fuel them, uh, or they'll basically uh, be skipping breakfast and not have fuel. Too many processed foods will give you a lot of things that affect the body. Uh, one of the big problems with processed foods is the iron enrichment in white flour. This iron enrichment can damage the arteries. And a lot of problems as people get older is the damage of the arteries to the neck, uh, carotid arteries. So then your brain doesn't get an iron in food is one of the most, in foods that are not, pro that are processed. The iron that is in white flour is basically iron filings. And so basically your body absorbs them whether you need it or not. Um, I think red meat, I don't recommend ex except for certain circumstances that people eat red meat seven days a week. Potentially some people can get too much iron if they overate natural red meat, but red meat is a food that for many people, the body will actually make balance for that and not absorb it all, except for some people who have a defect in that area. They have to be careful. A restrictive diet that is missing adequate nutrients and important categories of food. Um, to talk about this, I'll uh, talk a little bit about my experience. For 27 years, I taught at a school that was teaching either primarily vegan or a vegan diet for people for health and healing. And many people were almost vegan, eating fish very irregularly, no other animal food. And when I started studying about brain chemicals and the effect on moods and how it affects your moods, it can affect depression or irritability or being uptight if you don't have enough GABA, um, or seeking pleasure from other things like alcohol or, uh, or cigarettes or things like that. In that community at this school I was teaching at, uh, people would, there was a certain amount of people who would have problems with alcohol. They were self-medicating. Uh, some people, some of the long-term teachers would smoke because one of the main teachers was a smoker. So they were, which affects your moods. Uh, some people also would basically have strange behavior. Uh, they would also be very uptight. Um, they would be uh, critical. Uh, they would be angry. Some people would be prone to depression, anxiety. And after I studied about brain chemicals, particularly thanks to uh, Julia Ross's books, I realized that they had brain chemical imbalances from nutritional deficiencies, protein deficiencies, and fat deficiencies because they were eating carbohydrates and they were eating vegetables, but they didn't have these. And so that, that's where I, I was, uh, I had, uh, you might say I had an experiment going on be before me. <laughs> so, so I could see the results of uh, what they were doing. Uh, excessive alcohol itself uh, will affect the brain and start to damage the brain in different ways. So part of the ways that it damages the brain is because you use large amounts of nutrients when you're drinking a lot of alcohol. Moderate alcohol can be fine for people. It depends on the person, uh, how it affects them, but that could be fine. Now, in addition to the, the nutrients that are good for the brain, brain function and help your mind, right there, the uh, effect of things that uh, are toxic in our diet for us. There is also lifestyle pra practices that influence nutrition in the mind. 
So the first one can be surprising, surprising to a lot of people. It's too little or too much exercise, too much or too little exercise. So when you do too much exercise, what happens is the body can't recover and uses up a lot of nutrients. It uses up a lot of protein. It puts the body in stress. And basically, it. Uh, so what happens is that it affects the mind because you start to use up protein, you use up the sugar, you use up fats. If you don't make balance for that, it puts the body into stress. And I'll talk about how the stress that this causes can cause effects on the brain. Too little exercise will then make it so that you don't have nutrients and oxygen circulating to the brain. A lot of research has been done on elderly people. I think it's been done on elderly people because generally people see a cognitive decline as people get older. And they found that when people exercise regularly, especially exercise that got oxygen to the system, uh, a certain amount of aerobic exercise, then the brain function, cognitive function, improved dramatically based on testing. So not just based on watching a person, but based on testing. So we need a certain amount of exercise for our body. And there's another aspect of exercise that I'll talk about in that if you don't exercise, the body gets tighter and tighter and circulation slows down to the organs. And because the body and mind are one, when the organs don't function, the brain stops functioning. This is something that is recognized more and more in certain kinds of research, but they intuitively and observationally recognize this in Asian medicine. Exposure to toxins. I talked about this before. We're exposed to, well, we may not be exposed to all of them, but there's about 100,000 chemicals that have been approved by industry, which many of which have never been tested for safety. And most of them have not been tested for their synergistic effects. If you research this or search online, you'll find that a few people have taken three chemicals that we're often exposed to and found that those chemicals, when combined, have a bad effect on health of animals and people. I think they might mostly do this on animals, but on people too. Now, also, I like to, uh, my standard joke about this is that there's something called the GRAS list for food. And, and many of this is from chemicals that are released in industry. GRS means generally recognized as safe. I think that's a great term, right? <laughs> it's generally recognized as safe. We don't know if it's safe. It might be safe. It's recognized. Like, so if, uh, if you went into a plane and uh, sat down at your seat and you saw that there was a sign that the pilot was generally recognized as qualified, I don't think you would feel very secure at that. So uh, that doesn't give me a vote of security. Unfortunately, the the parts of the government that are basically regulating these things are often tied to industry. So to help our body, because many of these are cancer causing these toxins, it's best to try not to be exposed to toxins as much as we can in our home, in our work, and to take safety precautions if we are, are exposed to toxins, if we have to be ex exposed to toxins in work, and also, there are certain types of foods and substances that most of us, if not all of us, I would say all of us should take in order to get rid of toxins because we accumulate the toxins just like those pregnant women accumulated the toxins when they were after birth, after they gave birth in their breast milk. So we all have the toxins in our body. So there's ways to detoxify the body. One of the ways is to take some kind of green substances. One of them is called chlorella. And to take this because the this, 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 this detoxifies chemicals, but it also detoxifies heavy metals that are still in the air that we're exposed to. Other things, there are certain things like vitamin C. Uh, taking vitamin C helps the body get rid of toxins more, it detoxifies the body. So I recommend people do consider taking a few thousand milligrams of vitamin C 
to detoxify the body. Also, I recommend that there are, there are sometimes powders that you could buy that are organic, green and red powders. They have all kinds of things in them that basically have detoxifying effects on the body. The red powders are powders of things like the berries and some other substances that help the body detoxify. So I encourage people to look at some of those organic ones and take them once a day to have a detoxifying effect. And of course, I recommend people don't take any toxins in their diet uh, because the, basically your body will detoxify better. Your body will function better if you are not taking, are you eating a balanced diet? On my website, you can also see what I call a balanced diet. If you look at my website, which I'll mention later, but mention now macrobiotic.com, it's, uh, it's basically, I talk, call my approach to longevity eating a full spectrum macrobiotic diet, but it doesn't exclude any kind of food so that it's just a balance of foods so that we don't get toxins or dot food. And we optimize how our body functions to get rid of these toxins. So for instance, the body gets rid of toxins through the liver and through the kidneys and through the intestines. So when you're exercising and eating away and have a fairly balanced lifestyle, which we'll talk about in a minute, your body will function better to get rid of these toxins as long as you're not exposed to a lot of them in the environments. And for people living in cities, there's bad news. It's pretty hard to get rid of toxins from all the stuff you're getting from the air in places like New York City and LA. So uh, those are long-term, there are not good places to live for health and longevity of your body and your brain because of that factor. And uh, although you could do better if you're eating better and taking care of your health and uh, taking certain herbs and supplements. Now, stress is a, a huge topic that I have, uh, I have basically whole lectures that I talk about the effect of stress but briefly, I'll say that the, uh, the person who, if you want to learn about stress, there's a man named Hans Seely, S-E-L-Y-E. He was the father of stress. He wasn't the father who made stress. That sounds, sounds like he made stress. But the father of stress in that he basically discovered the role of stress has on our body and mind. And so basically there are many stresses in our lifestyle that causes problems. Some of them are exposure to toxins. Some is irregular lifestyles. Some is too much exercise or too little exercise. Some is not getting enough sleep. These are all the things that cause stress. Some stress comes from internally, your mind. So using practices and using things like self-reflection and critical thinking about your own thinking so that you don't get stressed and doing practices like meditation, which help the body get rid of, be in a less stressful effect for the mind. Uh, so de-stressing lifestyle practices, having a regular diet, regular lifestyle, regular eating, regular sleep, um, exposure to nature, going out to being with nature. These are all de-stressing parts of your lifestyle and understanding about stress. I, I have some lectures that I do. I think I may have even some free materials which you could start to learn more about how to take care of stress because long time effect of stress is the brain function goes down. Other functions like the immune function goes down, the brain function goes down, metabolism goes down. So stress affects large parts of the body. If you want to read about all the effects of stress, but no solutions. There's a book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. It's by Robert Sapolsky, an Irishman like me, right? Uh, Roger, Rob, Roger, Robert Sapolsky, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. I'll give you the, I'll give you the uh, answer to that question, but the book is still re worth reading. Zebras don't get ulcers because they only have one stressful period in their life, running away from lions. When that's over, their lifestyle is pretty good. If they don't make it, no problem, right? <laughs> Nothing to worry about, no stress. If they make it, then all their stress hormones go down. 
But in modern lifestyle, often our stress hormones are continually going. So we have to create strategies in our unusual modern lifestyles and, and stresses and deadlines so that we could get out of stress. Now, so there's a bunch of de-stressing lifestyle practices. I talk more about these in my website. De-stressing exercises. I, I teach this to people. I teach certain kinds of Qigong exercises and therapeutic exercises because the long-term effect of stress is to distort the posture, which cuts off the circulation to the organs. Very common is the body goes forward, cutting off circulation to the organs in the front. Or the body has an excessive curve in the back causing back problems, lower back problems. So there are exercises that you can do to de-stress. And if you want to just read about them, I would recommend going to my website to read more about them. So exercise in general, a certain amount of exercise daily helps the brain to function. And I think this mostly, this is the aerobic exercise, but keeping the body healthy by doing something for strength, something for stretching the body, moving the body is healthy. And of course, uh, a lot of times people, as we get older, we have to basically work to do this because of the stresses of life. We don't make time for exercise and we don't have lifestyles except for the people who are farming, who are coming to the NOFA conference, who have plenty of exercise. We don't make exercise. Now, of course, modern farming today, even for people who are doing sustainable and organic farming, may have less physical effort than before, which means we need to still, like if you're riding tractors and using machinery. So that means there's still a need for us to do exercise beyond what we're doing. And uh, therapeutic exercises are different. And then sleep, the average American is said to sleep five hours a day, five to six hours a day, but it's during sleep the body regenerates. And if you don't get enough regeneration, the body goes into a stress mode, which affects cognitive function, overall health uh, in the body, and even pr proceeds to degenerate disease. So most people need at least eight or nine, nine hours of sleep. A uh, hundred years ago, there's some evidence that people ate or slept about eight or nine hours. A lot of that had to do because we didn't have computers, we didn't have central, we didn't have lighting, uh, we didn't have 24-7 uh, movies, and we didn't have all this technology that would keep us up. So uh, this is a point that even though we have a modern lifestyle, we have to be careful of technology because it's been found that even looking at cell phones all day put you in stress and uh, looking at the computer all day puts you in stress. Some of us have occupational hazards, but we, try to, we should try to balance our, our lifestyle as much as we can to help. So here's an example of stress. <laughs> this person's in a lot of stress. I, I don't think we have to, uh, for most people, they know what being under a lot of stress is. Now, um, last thing I'll just- We have about 10 minutes left. Okay. So just the last thing I'll mention is that Alzheimer's and, uh, is a common problem in the aging brain. And it's been found that this is related to malnutrition. As people get older, they don't eat enough nutrients. And particularly with the modern diet, which is nutritionally lacking, it's not nutritionally dense enough. So a lot of the nutrition that we talked about before will prevent brain diseases. Some of that has to do with supplements, that would be beneficial for people. And then also exercise. There are very particular supplements that I recommend people go to my website and look at some of the articles I wrote uh, about, about this on my blog. And we talked about the role of exercise too. So here is a list of supplements that basically I'll just briefly talk about because uh, we may not have many questions in right now, but I'll, I'll, briefly, uh, I'll brief, briefly talk about, we'll talk about more if we needed to later. So a multivitamin, for most people, a multivitamin even at any age is good because they've actually done studies because of most children 
and teenagers eating a modern diet, they've done studies where they've given them a multivitamin and over a period of time before and after they tested their IQ and their IQ went up a certain amount of points. I mean, not 300 points, but went up like a substantial amount of points that was not normal just by giving a multivitamin. So most people, because we are exposed to a lot of stresses that are using up nutrients, like stress uses up high amounts of B vitamins and vitamin C, a good quality multivitamin would be helpful. Vitamin C also is part of that because it protects the brain and also improves your thinking. It makes you more alert when you have a certain amount of vitamin C in the body. There's uh, parts of the body that require more vitamin C. So the brain is one of those parts and your, your, uh, your basically your spinal cord. It keeps, it needs a lot of vitamin C and spinal cord is the communicator between the brain and the body. B12 is essential. Uh, B12 makes many cognitive and mood problems when it's deficient. And the interesting thing, uh, that's why I think, the interesting thing is that when they study this, there's a really good book for people who want to know more about B12 could uh, be called, Could It Be B12? <laughs> and because a lot of people are showing up in the emergency room, these are, this is a book written by an emergency room doctor and nurse who happened to be a husband and wife team. And a lot of people are showing up in American emergency rooms in the past who had these symptoms that were misdiagnosed and found to be severe B12 deficiencies. This is occurring for people who are eating meat because the rest of the modern diet, high in refined foods and bad fats and poor quality foods, too much alcohol, drugs and medicines that people are taking, interfere with the B12 and other nutrient absorption. So they are becoming B12 deficient even though they're eating meat. And your digestion becomes weaker as we get older. So I think there's evidence for many people to take B12 after 60, even eat, eating healthfully. B vitamins also are supplements that can be helpful for people. And as people get into advanced age, they don't absorb as many B vitamins. Of course, if you wanna take a B vitamin supplement from a food, then look at organ meats from healthy raised animals like liver or other because they're very extremely high in, in B vitamins. Acetylcarnitine is a supplement that protects the brain. This has been used for Alzheimer's. And carnitine, of course, is in from the word carnivorous. So it's high in um, carnivorous foods, it's meat, high in meat. But this can be used as a supplement. There's many adaptogenic, typo there, it should be adaptogenic tonic herbs that are used. And um, these adaptogenic time, if you want to learn about this, uh, there is a, a person who has, I have some information on my website on tonic herbs and some articles on this. And these have a good effect on the brain. And zinc and other nutrients uh, have been found to be helpful. Now, uh, here's an example of uh, when your adrenals are on fire, it also affects your, makes you hyper, hyperactive. And one of the things that happens if you don't have enough nutrients in your diet or you're skipping meals or don't have enough calories or sugars, you can go into the, what used to be called low blood sugar, but it really can be called hyperadrenal. This makes you anxious, you can't think as well, uh, it makes you upset. We talked a little bit, I just have, this is uh, the biology of emotions is the four brain chemicals, just to review what I talked about. And the energetics of diet, lifestyle, and emotions, I'll just briefly say is that traditional cultures understood that the body, energy, the substance of the body, the energy, and the energy of the mind were all connected. Poetically, they called these the three treasures. And so we have to work on the whole body, energy, mind, lifestyle, to have good brain function. The brain is not just the brain, it's the whole body function. Okay, and this is information to contact me. So uh, I know we have a few minutes. Uh, I didn't see if there would be a lot of questions, but if you have any questions, if anybody has questions about what I talked about, otherwise I can keep talking. 
want to say thank you again, John, for all of that great information and insight. Oh, I have you're a welcome. Few 